Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our broadcast of the Birdability Field Trip. I'm Dottie Head. I'm the Communications Director for Georgia Audubon, and I will be just kind of serving as your host this morning. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them either in the chat box or the Q&A. Um, we are also broadcasting this live on Zoom, so we have people joining us both from Zoom and Facebook Live. I'm going to turn it over to Karina Newsom, Georgia Audubon's Community Engagement Manager, to get us started. Karina, it's all you. All right, thank you so much, Dottie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to uh, Georgia Audubon in collaboration with Birdability's uh, Accessible Virtual Field Trips. Um, this morning, we're joined uh, by guests from Massachusetts and California and Alabama, and then me here in Georgia. And we're gonna be talking all about um, accessible trails and the locations where we are birding, um, highlighting the accessibility challenges that folks experience in the outdoors. And of course, celebrating the birds that we're seeing in different parts of the country as well. Um, as Dottie said, my name is Karina Newsom. I am actually here in Atlanta, Georgia at Piedmont Park, which is an urban park in the middle of the city that is just chock full of so many different kinds of birds. And I'm eager to share that with you. Um, I'll go ahead and pass it over to Freya to introduce herself and tell you a little bit about the birdability. Um, and then we'll go around and introduce the rest of our guests. Go ahead, Freya. Hi, everyone. I'm Freya McGregor. I'm the Birdability Coordinator, and I'm at Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge, which is really exciting. I'll tell you a little bit more about that after we introduce everybody. But Birdability, um, if you aren't aware of our work, we're all about breaking down the barriers that um, birders and potential future birders who um, experience some kind of accessibility challenge due to a disability or health concern um, have when they're trying to go birding, both out on trails and in birding locations and within the birding community. So if you'd like to know more, birdability.org is our website. And you can also follow me on Instagram at the OT Birder. Uh, and so we're really excited to partner with George Audubon to help um, highlight the really awesome accessible birding locations around the US and also um, share the stories of some birders who experience accessibility challenges. So I'm looking forward to going birding with our guest co-host today. Hey, uh, Alexander, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, there we are. Good morning from uh, sunny Southern California. Right here, like, as the sun just rose. Right now, I'm at Lake Balboa, which is a large uh, man-made recreational lake, literally right in the center of the San Fernando Valley. And behind me right now, I've got a couple of Egyptian geese. I'm also experiencing blast of the overnight winds, so I'm going to be muted for probably the uh, next 10 minutes at least. Thanks, Alexander. Hey, Jerry, would you like to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about you and what, what um, kind of birding you're doing today? Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jerry Barrier, and I'm located in Malden, Massachusetts, near Boston. And I am a person who is totally blind. Um, I've been birding by ear since the 1970s when I was in college and got introduced to it by a biology professor. And uh, I... I probably enjoy that more than any other hobby I've ever been involved in. And I've been involved in plenty of them, but I, um, I get out when I can, but when I'm in my house, I sit at my computer and I can listen to the birds from my front yard and my backyard through microphones that I have mounted outside. And that helps to uh, give me the opportunity to listen to birds. But I love learning new bird sounds and I like getting out and birding when I can with other people. And it's been a wonderful hobby for me. Thank you. Awesome, perfect. So we'll go ahead and um, pass it over to Freya. We're gonna start with Freya because Freya is in a really special location this morning and has some really cool birds to show us. So Freya, show us where you are and what you're seeing. So I, I'm at Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge, which is in northern Alabama, and it's one of the best places to see overwintering sandhill cranes. Um, the current count, count is that there are 21,000 sandhill cranes at Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge right now, which is a lot of birds, uh, and seven 
hooping cranes. Hooping cranes are endangered. They're like super special. They're also white and a lot bigger than sandhill cranes. And before I show you where I am, I just want to show you the birds that I can see. That maybe doesn't look so excited, but I'm going to get you here in my binoculars. There is a lot of sandhill cranes out there. Sneaking around, doing crane things. Oh, bit of chasing. But just behind that pole is a larger white bird. Hopefully you can tell it's white against the gray. That's a hooping crane. That's one of seven that's here. So it's pretty fantastic that uh, it's sticking around for us all to have a look at. That's, that's very cool. Here, here goes some sandhill cranes flying past. Um, so I'm in, oh, sorry, I am, I'm in uh, the big observation building that's here. And this has been closed for the last nine months or so because of COVID and it's hard to socially distance inside a building. But the really kind folks here at Wheeler have let me in just, just to show you all about this, which is very, very awesome of them. So this um, observation building, uh, there's a very um, tight patch gravel uh, path out here. It's not very far from the visitor center where there's accessible parking. So it, by not very far, um, uh, 100 feet, maybe maybe 200 feet. Uh, so it's it's pretty it's a pretty short distance to get to this building in normal times when it's open, which is not right now. And uh, when you get in here, this is this is what it looks like. Now, excuse my <laughs> beanie. It's cold outside. My woolies are sitting there. These seats are normally out, but I've been chatting with the ranger, and we're thinking that they might be able to leave these seats packed up when we go back to having the building open um, and only pull them out when they have school groups so that, because if, if these seats are packed away like this, someone in a wheelchair or with a walking frame can maneuver through this building a lot more easily than they could if these bleacher style seats were out here taking up most of the space. And if these, these folks here at Wheeler had chairs that could be moved around, that would make this building a lot more accessible. So. Um, hopefully that will be what happens going forward. So here's the view from this, from this observation building. One other thing that I want to point out about this is that the windows are floor to ceiling and in an observation blind, like a traditional one, sometimes the, the wall will go up higher than the height of a seated person. Now, if someone's in a wheelchair and they can't see over that wall, they're not gonna be able to see anything that the blind is trying to let them see. So having a complete window is really, really much more ideal and, and much more accessible for everybody. Um, normally they have the scopes set up uh, here, but they've taken them down for COVID. There's one there that's the height of a standing person, but there's also super cool to see. There's a scope set up and there's a little wheelchair sign on it too. There's the scope set up at the height of a seated person like someone using a wheelchair. So that is really cool. I, I think that's really awesome that they have that set up. Um, in this, this building actually has views on three sides, which is pretty fabulous. So there's more sandhill cranes and other waterfowl out here. In fact, there were two more. There's another hooping crane out there out of seven. How lucky are we? We get to see two that you have to believe me, maybe there's a little white dot way out there of a hooping crane. There's also, um, there's an upstairs, which we won't go up because not everyone can do stairs, but there is an upstairs, which is fun. If you can do stairs, um, there's more places to see. And then there's a little water feature out here and um, a wood duck nest box. So, and some, some ducks out there. Uh, I didn't expect to see those. Uh, I think they're ring neck ducks mostly. So, this is really cool. And, and I wanted to show you all, there are the ducks. I wanted to show you all this building because it's a really fantastic example of how such a fancy observation building can also be built to be accessible, um, which is really, really awesome. So if you all ever get a chance to come, come to Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge in the winter, um, hopefully this building will be open. If not, there's lots more accessibility stuff and I'll show you in a second, but it's a really cool place. And, and these sandhill cranes, uh, they're just super. I'll just show you once more before I pass it over to someone else. These, these guys are great. 
Grand Tour Crane, so much fun. All right. Has anyone got any anything to share? Wow, Freya, that is absolutely amazing. Thank you for showing us the crane. My end. And that was a really cool presentation. Right here at the lake, well, in the parking lot of the lake, actually, I've got about a dozen Egyptian geese which were introduced from Sub-Saharan Africa about four years ago. Since you're calling right hey, now. Hey, Alexander, can you tell us where you are one more time, please? You, the wind was really affecting your sound when you introduced yourself. Okay, I will do that in a sec because I've also got a wood deck, which is not usually found at this location. And I have or had Okay, so I have a small flock of bark sparrows. A bit harder to see moving around in the grass. Yes, yeah, so those are the birds where I am. So, once again, I am Alexander DeBarros. I lead bird walks for San Fernando Audubon and the Audubon Center at Debs Park. Right now, I am at Lake Balboa, which is a recreational lake in the center of the San Fernando Valley. It's got a nice flat trail going around the whole perimeter, and it is one of the birdiest spots in LA. Awesome, thank you so much, Alexander. And Freya, those are really cool birds. It's really awesome to be able to, uh, in Andy. the winter, even though it is cold, not so much necessarily where Alexander is, but maybe the rest of us are a little chilly, but the birds are popping this morning. Um, so really quickly, uh, or as long as you need, actually, Jerry, if you are uh, hearing any birds that you are um, interested in sharing with us, you can definitely uh, feel free. And if you wouldn't mind, actually, uh, one more time, just describing the setup that you have uh, to detect the birds that you have around your home. Um, that would be really cool. Um, again, just for everyone who's joining us now, this is the uh, collaborative virtual birdability field trip that uh, George Audubon and Birdability have collaborated on. Um, and so once a month, we have guests from around the country highlighting accessible birding locations, um, highlighting the accessibility challenges that folks uh, experience when birding and the birds that are found in different parts of our country. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over uh, to Jerry to describe uh, what he might be hearing as far as the birds outside his home. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay, very good. Uh, well, I, um, I'll go into maybe more detail than anybody wants to hear, but I'll tell you what my setup is. I have two uh, Shure boundary mics, which are sort of a flat mic. They're typically used in conference rooms, but I mounted them uh, with help from my dear wife, Lee, under the eaves uh, in the back and under an overhang in the front so that they're pretty much out of the weather. And they do fairly well in windy conditions, but I did put a windscreen on one of them. Um, I have cables coming from those microphones into a, a standard audio mixer that might be used by musicians or people like that. And they have the audio mixer connected into my computer. Yes. So I can listen to my front yard separately from the backyard, or I can listen to them both at the same time. So I'm getting the front yard, it would be on my right side, which is closer to the front of the house and the backyard would be on my left. So that's, that's the basic setup I have. And there certainly are simpler ways to do it. Uh, from time to time, there have been commercial products available that you could buy uh, that simply had a very thin little cable that went to a small microphone that you'd stick out the window and then a little box like the size of a small radio inside. And I don't know if there are any of those on the market right now. I know the one that I used to have was called a nature's window. Um, <clears throat> another thing I'd like to talk about at some point, if it's okay, is an app that I use for learning bird sounds. And I've used lots of them over the years, but I have found an iPhone app that if it's okay to actually uh, plug a specific app, app, I'd like to be able to talk about that. Absolutely, yes, you can. Okay. Um, well, I found an app called LarkWire, L-A-R-K-W-I-R-E, LarkWire, 
which is for learning bird sounds. And the way it works is um, you can tell it which groups of birds you want it to include, and then it will play a bird sound and you either hit, yeah, I think I know the answer to this or uh, I'm not sure. And then it tells you whether you are correct or not and it keeps track of what you've done. And it will continue to um, uh, widen the variety of birds or change the variety as you get really good at a, let's say that you got really good at fly catchers. It would begin not to show you those so much or let you hear those, but go on to other things. And I found only very recently that this app works very well with voiceover, which is what I use on my iPhone as a totally blind person to be able to operate the phone. It works very well with that. It's 100% uh, accessible. And I took it a step further only a couple of weeks ago. I got one of the newer iPhones and um, it has something on it called voice control that will let you control certain apps and tap on buttons and things like that with your voice. And I've learned how to use this LarkWire app while I'm on my exercise machine. And I'll start the app before I start exercising. And then uh, it'll play something and I will hit, I'll say tap no, that's tap, tap K-N-O-W, tap no if I think I know it. And it will tap it. And if I don't know it, I'll say tap not sure. And it will tell me what it is. And then I'll say tap OK. And then it'll go on to the next one. So I am having an absolute blast with it. Uh, but I do want to say that there are many other ways to learn bird sounds. There are lots of commercial uh, learning CDs that you can buy. There's a lot on the internet available and many ways to do it. But th that's how I've been doing it recently. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Jerry, for sharing the, the details. Oh, Freya, you've got something to show us. I just wanted to add real quick. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I know LarkWire is now a free app, so that's even more awesome um, and accessible to uh, any folks who who, uh, who would benefit from that. And, and you don't have to be totally blind or have a vision to benefit from learning bird sounds, of course. So yeah, LarkWire sounds awesome. Thanks, thanks, Jerry. Yes, I yes. forgot to mention that it's, it is a mainstream app. It wasn't developed for blind people. They also have a web-based app. That one is not accessible. So uh, just so you know. Got it. Thank you so much for that information, Jerry. That's phenomenal. I'll have to, I'll have to check out LarkWire because um, <laughs> I feel like I could benefit from that for sure. Now, I want to show you all what I'm seeing right now. Um, okay. So I, again, am in Atlanta, Georgia at Piedmont Park, which is a uh, very urban location for a, uh, uh, a green space, but it is wonderful. Um, before I get into the accessibility, I want to turn around. I'm at a lake in the middle of Piedmont Park, and right now I'm looking at a double-crested cormorant. Let's see if I can get the... Here we go. Digiscoping under pressure always makes me, makes me shake a little bit, but right in the center of my scope, there is a double-crested cormorant that is going between a little bit of preening and kind of sitting with their wings out as cormorants tend to do um, after they kind of start, you know, maybe take a bath, they'll sit on an elevated uh, maybe perch or log in the middle of some, um, on the edge of some water and kind of sit with their wings out as they dry off. Um, that's what this cormorant has been doing. Um, I've also got a variety of other waterfowl, both native and non-native, both wild and domestic. So right here in the center of my uh, binoculars, that is a male mallard, um, which you can tell is a male because of the nice iridescent, whoop, here we go, green head that they have. And let me go ahead and refocus my binoculars so you can see it as best you can. Let's see. Um, so it's in as much focus as possible. Yeah, so we've got a female mallard there, a male mallard there. Oh, and right next to me, we've got a, where are you? Canada goose, uh, a goose that uh, many people may be familiar with, but I always encourage people that even for the common birds and sometimes even the domestic birds. Uh, hey, Karina. Make, so, yeah. Real quick, I don't know if you can hear. There's like, can you guys hear that racket? There's a huge flock of sandhill cranes all calling, and it's, I don't, they're going to stop. So, can you all hear that? I heard it for a second. 
All right, let me see if I can fix my audio. Sorry, please keep talking about the Canada Goose. I just wanted to share this crazy <laughs> Santa Cruz <Crane> noise. <laughs> no, thank you for letting us know. So yeah, so the Canada Goose, these, the geese here in Piedmont Park are certainly not um, opposed to the presence of people and they tend to get quite close, probably because people are feeding them, which of course we certainly do not recommend that you feed wildlife, <laughs> um, no matter where you are. Um, but we've got the Canada Geese, the mallards, both male and female. And then we've got some domestic ducks that are an invasive species. Um, so we've got some Muscovy ducks, which uh, I think were introduced, I believe from South America, I, I, I think. And they've got lots of different color morphs um, and really have kind of taken over the, the lake at this park, which is not super great, but nonetheless, they are uh, fairly cool to, um, to encounter. But here at Piedmont Park, I'm going to flip myself around. Um, this is a quite an accessible location. There um, are several lo places to park on, depending on where you are in the perimeter of the park. Um, and at those locations, there are um, parking spots, uh, handicapped parking spots that have a lot of space. Um, so if you have a ramp for your for your vehicle, there is room for a ramp. Um, and there are paved trails all throughout the park, um, paved with cement. And where I am right now. At the lake that's kind of in the center or sort of in the center of the park um, there is a ramp that uh, travels from the main path that travels around the lake and through the park that kind of winds down a little bit at a um, at a manageable slope I believe down to this uh, kind of observation platform where you can take a look at all the waterfowl that are hanging out here um, at the lake in Piedmont Park um, but that's where I am right now and I'm going to start uh, walking now around the lake to see what birds I can find but Alexander, I see your scope moving. So if you want to share what you're looking at, feel free. All right. Thank you. And very informative. Right now I've got an American pipit in the scope. It's positioned right in the center. Don't know how focused it is for you guys, but here he is. American pipit is a tiny sparrow-like bird, but it is not closely related to the sparrows. It spends most of its time walking around on flat grassy areas or in, or in creeks. And it's best distinguished by sparrows because of its movement. When they move, sparrows always hop a bit and pipits always walk one foot in front of the other. Super cool. I haven't seen an American pivot. Thanks, Alexander. It's almost like I saw one with you then. <laughs> um, I'm just going to see, guys, just in case this works, I'm shifting my audio in case you can hear um, the sandhill cranes. Now, they're not making as much noise as they were a minute ago. But can you guys hear kind of a soft kind of trumpet? Yes. Yes. Great. Good evening. Wonderful. Yes. Mm -hmm. if if they so a huge flock just like took off and they were all calling it was bananas but because I have you guys in my ears um the microphone is only like designed to pick up my mouth and not all the background sounds so um if they make another big noise again I will uh, be sure to be sure to uh let because I it's one of my favorite sounds um sandhill cranes are one of my favorite sounds they often call when they're flying um, kind of softly to each other, just keeping in touch with everybody. And, and I think it's just magic. Um, but while I've got you, just next to the visitor center here at Wheeler, there is a, the Atkinson Cypress Trail, which is a half mile loop. And it's a really great example of an accessible trail as well. Now the visitor center is, is, is that close. Um, it's currently closed due to COVID, but there are some portaloos outside if, if you need them. So that's good to know. Now this, this trail, um, last time I was here, there were like a million cedar waxwings. Maybe that's a slight uh, exaggeration, but there were a lot of cedar waxwings along this trail. And so the crash gravel, it's really wide. That's great. And we get to this boardwalk that has, uh, that winds through this, this lovely cypress swamp. Now, one thing that was the case last time that does, that does have an impact on accessibility and we might not often think about it. Last time I was here, two, about two months ago, the um, cypress uh, needles, le they're not leaves, I'm not, the, 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 the stuff that's normally green that hangs on branches, um, because it was the end of fall, it had all fallen down onto this, onto this boardwalk and it was actually so thick, like it was half a foot to a foot thick and it was all right for me to walk over 
But if someone was here with a wheelchair, with a walking frame, with a stroller, with a little kid, it would have been really, really hard to navigate over that big, thick kind of layer of cushiony cypress needle things. Um, so that's really interesting. And, and when I spoke to the folks here, they said they come out and blow it off the boardwalk every week. So they knew that this was a problem. They knew they had to do something about it. And um, that's awesome. Um, and maybe I just got there the day before but that may indicate they need to come out and blow it more than once a week. So we talked about that and they, they're totally taking that, um, that uh, recommendation on board. So that's really awesome. It shows you that um, there are a lot of folks out there that if you give them some information about, about how to improve the accessibility of their, of their place, they'll, they'll try really hard to, to do that for you. So um, advocate if you politely and positively advocate for improvements and you never know what might happen. Um, if you want a hand with knowing how to write an email or anything, there is a template on our website at birdability.org under resources that you can download and add in your own information. But it's sort of just a, an easy template to kind of work from or use if you wanted to send an email to your local your city council or the, um, the state park, someone to say, hey, like, look, that was great. But this would be better if, you, if you're able to do this little tweak. So advocacy is awesome. And so is this boardwalk. If I may pop in for a sec, I've got to a I've got an accessibility challenge with the trail that I'm on right now. So as soon as the camera switches, there we go. So the whole trail I'm on is completely paved, except for this. Actually, that doesn't really look as good as I hoped. So switching back around, the whole trail I'm on is completely paved in concrete, except for this one. Didn't pass by, except for this one little spot to in the crosswalk. There is a connection between the pavement and the concrete to a few feet away, but that's not actually in the crosswalk. Mm, that's a good point to make, Alexander. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, and Freya for pointing out the, the gaps in accessibility, because oftentimes, you know, there may be a generally accessible trail, right? And then for some reason, there's a gap in that accessibility, whether it's because of seasonal issues like leaves falling, needles, whatever they are, Freya, falling on the ground or issues with pavement. Um, really quickly, before I go into the birds that I'm seeing right now, uh, Jerry or Alexander, is there anything that you wanted to share bird-wise before I, before I uh, share what I've got here? Okay. Uh, this is Jerry. Um, Hi, Jerry. Since I'm not able show you birds around here. I just want to point out some of the ones that I typically hear from where I live. Um, one that I don't typically hear that I heard recently and got a great thrill from was a, an Eastern screech owl. That was at about uh, 5.30 or 6 o'clock one morning. And I heard that through my speakers on my computer. Uh, but I get a lot of Carolina wrens with their tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle call. I get a lot of blue jays, um, American goldfinch, red-bellied woodpeckers, northern flickers, um, house sparrows, chickadees, chickadees uh, black-capped chickadees. I've never heard the Carolina chickadee here. Um, let's see, what else? Well, of course, robins and cardinals and morning doves, morning doves lots of morning doves. Um, and we have feeders both in front and back to attract the birds in it. We've only lived here for a year, but we seem to have become a very popular bird place. So we're happy about that. That's it for me. That was fun. Yeah. That's amazing. Jerry, would you actually mind telling us a bit about that really cool hoodie you're wearing right now? <laughs> actually, oh. one quick sec before you do, Jerry. I've got a bunch of birds because I am now out of the parking lot and at the lake. So right here, right now, I've got a, a couple hundred American coots. Wow. This uh, lake is the best spot for American coots in the San Fernando Valley. Most years on the Christmas bird count, they are the most numerous bird count, numbering uh, into the thousands. And the lake always has at least 900 of them. <laughs> also got a flock of uh, American white pelicans on the far side of the lake. The pelicans uh, winter here and typically breed around the Great Salt Lake. And a bit closer are a few mallards. We're here a second ago. There's one. A few mallards. And 
some American Widgeons. The brown, brownish duck. Wait, no, that's a mallard. Where was the Widgeon? Okay, not seeing the Widgeon anymore, but still lots of cool birds. And that's all I've got. That was super cool. Thank you so much, Alexander. Man, I've never seen that many coots in my whole life at all. <laughs> all right, Jerry, back to you with the cool swag that you've got on. Okay, so this uh, is a, um, a bird ability shirt. It actually has Braille on it. It's not written like Braille that a blind person would read, although I can feel it. It's, I think they use puff paint to make it. But it says bird on, which is the hash, hashtag um, that we're using for bird ability. And <clears throat> this, um, this was a, uh, a great project that Freya was directly involved in with some other people to create uh, t-shirts, short sleeve, long sleeve, and also hoodies. And they only sold them for a short period of time and they may bring them back again at some point. But uh, Freya, did you want to say anything more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, so actually, um, this was a collaboration between the folks at Rogue Birders and Birdability. And those folks came up with the idea and inspired, in fact, by Jerry and his um, story during the panel discussion um, in Birdability Week, which was in October. If you haven't seen the panel discussion, it's really, really good. Both Jerry and Alexander were panelists and a couple other folks. Um, there's a link to it on the Birdability website. Uh, it's really, really worth watching. So. Um, yeah, so these rogue birders and, and we created these, um, the t-shirts and hoodies to try and start a conversation. I mean, it's, it's not really designed to be read. I mean, it's on your chest, it's kind of weird, but um, read by someone, who, by someone who's a braille reader. But it, hopefully someone will come up to you and say, hey, look, is that braille? Like what's on, your, what's on your shirt? And you can say, oh, well, actually, accessibility, inclusivity, birding, woohoo, everyone can do it. And um, I'm wearing this coat because it's 35 degrees here, but I have my rogue birders bird on hoodie as well. So um, thanks very much to the folks at Rogue Birders. And we will be opening up that store again. Um, it's it's one of those things where you do it by batch. So, um, you know, it's only open for a few days, then everyone orders it and then it gets shipped when everyone's ordered it. So um, we'll be definitely opening up again. If you missed out, you haven't missed out for good. They're coming back. Um, and Jerry's showing us what's on the back. So I'll pass it back to Jerry. I'm unmuting you. Okay. All right, this is Lee speaking. This is, says birdability with the birdability.org and the hashtag bird on, on the back of the shirt. So if you're not a braille reader or if you are, you can say, well, this is what it's about. Go to the website, show people the back of the shirt too. And they're very good quality and they're very soft and it's just we got a bunch of them for our family for christmas and and everybody's very proud of jerry and very happy for him that he, he was inspiring this project yeah th thanks thanks lean jerry and um yeah all the money raised from selling these t-shirts and hoodies um is going to support birdability and our work to increase the inclusivity and accessibility of birding and the outdoors for birders who have disabilities and health concerns. So your money's going somewhere really good. Uh, and I'm not remotely biased, but this hoodie I've hardly taken off in the month that I've had it. Um, I haven't worn the t-shirt very much. It's been a little cold. The t-shirt fits really well. It's really comfy, but this hoodie is tops. So, and I'm not really a hoodie person. So um, maybe a little bit of bias, but totally recommended. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you so much. Plus. I may pop in for a sec. I've got yeah. to, some double crested cormorants pretty close up and some American white pelicans are now much closer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah these are fish eating birds, and this lake is stocked with fish, mostly for fishermen, but the birds have really made it their own. Further. Hold on. So further across the lake, there's some more mallards and domestic ducks. There's also a raft of lesser scalps and ringneck ducks that always hangs around. 
And on the far side of the lake, I think those are the mute swans. There's two mute swans that live at this lake. They were brought here because they match the swan-shaped paddle boats that are found that are docked here. Thanks for that, Alexander. Yeah, I guess we, we wouldn't recommend like <laughs> importing uh, non-native species to match the paddle boats, right? Probably not a great idea, but that's so cool. Um, that was such a great view of the uh, American white pelicans, Alexander. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, real quick, since uh, I got a, a closer vantage point to our cormorant friend, I know um, Alexander just showed us a cormorant as well. Where'd you go? So there we are. Um, Hopefully the focus will help me out here, but this double crested cormorant is still here hanging out. Um, and these birds do have, uh, they've got less feather oil, less preening oil um, on their feathers than most birds do. Birds do produce oil that they will put on their feathers from a nice little gland above their butt um, to help keep them waterproof. And cormorants have much less of that. And it actually helps them to uh, be able to dive. They're diving birds. Oop, there's a poop in the forest right there on camera. Um, it helps them to, to, to dive for fish because they are almost pretty strictly fish eating birds. And so having less oil allows them to submerge themselves a whole lot easier. Um, that's also the, also the reason why you see them usually basking in the sun pretty often. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out about this trail that I'm on, so I mentioned that uh, this trail is paved that leads down to a close vantage point to this water body here in Piedmont Park in Atlanta, Georgia. But talking about gaps in accessibility, occasionally, seasonally, there will be a lot of rain. And right now we've been in a kind of a rainy season here in Atlanta. And there is a portion that has um, a portion of the trail that is gravel and packed dirt. And when it rains, it gets really muddy and fills with puddles. And so seasonally, this trail um, may not be accessible um, if you uh, are moving, uh, if you are locomoting in a wheelchair and you want to get a better vantage point of the lake so that's something to keep in mind and something to again as Freya said to advocate to your local parks or your uh, local green spaces about if you are noticing gaps in accessibility just to make them aware of it because usually people want their parks to be as accessible as possible so we've we found well uh, Freya and, and Virginia Rose who are the bird ability leaders uh, have found they've had good success when it comes to people's receptability to, to hearing what you have to say and, and making the changes um, uh, when they can. So um, we are always encouraging you to go ahead and be an advocate for the spaces where you bird. Um, so does anyone have uh, anything they're noticing about their trails or the birds around them that they would like to share? I'll go ahead and open up the floor. This is Lee, if I can throw one more story at everybody who's watching, Boston also has a pair of swans for their swan boats at the Boston Public Garden. And I'd have to double check some of my facts, but it, it, I understand years ago, they were named Romeo and Juliet, and they used to take them out of the lake at the end of the season, and they lived at Park Plaza Hotel, and there was a big ceremony in Boston in the springtime when they put them back into the lake. <laughs> so it was, it was a big deal up here. Very cool. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Lee. Um, the Boston Public Garden is a beautiful place to go birding. I used to live up in Boston and the Public Garden right in town is, is a gorgeous spot and the swan boats are very cute. Um, I just wanted to show you all, I'm at one of the photo blinds that's recently been set up here at Wheeler. Again, I'm just, the visitor center is just behind me. So these places are all really easy to get to from the visitor center. Um, now, this, this photo blind has got a really cool thing, but unfortunately, I mean, tan bark or this like, um, I'd call it tan bark, I'm from Australia though. They're like, um, you know, crunched up small bits of wood <laughs> surface. Definitely better than mud, um, but maybe not the best surface. I know these folks here are working on that really hard. So here's the photo blind. Now, a lot of photo blinds, like I said before, they may only have a window or a viewpoint that's the height of a standing person, which, isn't really cool but these guys these guys have a, a window that's at the height of someone who's seated so this is just great um the hole is so you can stick your lens out if you have a fancy camera i don't so just gonna... wow that's creepy uh, open up the whole window out there there's um let's see what we can see just sandhill cranes everywhere y'all this is so good stop making noise which is a shame because they were making a lot of noise before. If, if they do start calling again, I'll um, 
I'm going to interrupt whoever's talking and uh, <laughs> share that with you because it's such a great noise. And um, wow, that's so creaky. But um, yeah, so this is this is a great example of a of what would be a really accessible photo blind if they just improve the surface on the ground a little bit more. But I know they've only just built this too. So give them time. Um, they're on it. So yeah. I saw Alexander had some birds. Yeah, go ahead, Alexander. Okay, right here I've got another flock of American coots. And there are a couple of poor blackbirds uh, over here by the bench. One nice thing about this lake is that it's the whole whole perimeter trail is littered with benches. Right now I've got a couple of Brewer's Blackbirds. Because there's lots of people here at the lake and a lot of them feed the birds, it's one of the best areas for drawing in American Coots and Mallards and Blackbirds. Alexander, that's so cool. Would you would you mind putting the scope on the blackbirds just for a second longer and unmuting yourself so we can take a, another look? I have never seen. So I've gotten some live birds today. Uh, I don't know if it counts if I'm not there, but it's live. So I feel like it kind of counts. Um, but Alexander is showing us some Brewers blackbirds. So I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and you can unmute Alexander. Yeah, thanks, Karina. I've also gotten a few live birds. That we don't have sandhill cranes uh, or whooping cranes in Southern California, so that's been uh, fun to get. Right here we've got uh, male and female uh, brewer's blackbirds. This lake is also good for brown head cowbirds and red-winged blackbirds. And further out on the lake, there's a small group of western gulls that are taking off. Lake is one of the best areas for gulls most years. This year overall was pretty bad for them. You said that one well, you said that you're experiencing kind of a wet spell. LA is experiencing a crazy dry spell. We've only had two storms this year, and one of those was after the Christmas bird count. There go the western gulls. On the far side of the lake, there's another large group of coots, and it looks like some of the domestic geese. This lake does, in addition to the mute swans, we've got mixed flock of gray lag geese and a couple of swan geese. So, yeah, we get a lot of unique birds at this lake. And here's a snowy egret flying around. Had another one fly fishing earlier. The snowy egrets, they are, I've only observed this behavior with them, but they will uh, fly over water and uh, try and uh, pluck fish from the surface uh, while they're in the air. Right, here comes another one. Uh, two snowy egrets in the scope now. Mallard just went by. And yeah, those are the local birds. Alexander, wow. You are, I mean, simply knocking it out of the park with all the birds you are seeing this morning. I know where I need to visit now when I go to California, hopefully. Uh, in the near future rather than the further. Um, Jerry, I had noticed that you were unmuted for a second. I'm not sure if you were uh, wanting to jump in, um, but if so, feel free to. Okay, yes. I just wanted to say something about um, why I can have continued doing birding by ear for so many years. Uh, it's not just that I like learning the sounds, but I found that uh, listening to birds and learning about them have heightened my awareness of my surroundings. It's heightened my awareness of the seasons. Um, I, I enjoy, I love listening to Alexander talk about the birds that he's seeing. And I really get a lot out of that. But what I really love to hear is the sounds that they make. 
but it has just given me a uh, common ground with a lot of people whom, with whom I would have had little in common with before I got involved in this hobby. So it's a lot more than just getting a kick out of learning to identify the sounds. I'm birding no matter where I am all the time. As soon as I get out of a car, my ears are tuned to the birds and no matter where I go. And when I go on, I remember when I really hobby, when I would go on vacation, I just couldn't wait to, to stop at various places along the way to see what I could hear. And often I would hear birds that I didn't hear at home. And uh, so if you're a person who's blind and you're thinking, well, I don't know why I'd wanna get involved in this hobby. There are lots of good reasons for it to go way beyond just learning the sounds of the birds. So I just thought I would throw that in. All right, thank you very much, Jerry. And right now I've got a yellow rumped warbler. So uh, out here in California, we've got a different subspecies of yellow rumped warbler than uh, you get in Georgia. I had him for a second, now he's disappeared. It's, there was a yellow rumped warbler here. Well, while you're looking for your yellow rump, Alexander, I'm just gonna jump in and say, um, if any of you are interested in learning more about Jerry and the way he goes birding and maybe what it's like to be totally blind, um, or if you yourself are blind or have low vision, um, I'm really excited. We're partnering up with the Audubon Society of Northern Virginia and um, in hopefully in April, there will be, we're going to have a big program that'll be free for anyone to attend on Zoom. We'll record it so you can watch it later as well. Um, a big interview with Jerry about all the things that he does about birding and a little bit about what it's like to be totally blind and what he needs from the birding community in order to be included and um, what he needs from sighted folks to, um, to enable him to go birding in, in, if he joined a bird club or out on the trail. So I'm really excited to learn a lot more from Jerry and I know a lot of people um, Jerry, I know a lot of people were really excited to learn from you in the panel discussion. So this is going to be a really great opportunity for that deep dive. So if you're interested in learning more, um, stay tuned. Um, get on the BirdAbility website, birdability.org. Follow me on Instagram if you're on Instagram at the OT Birder. Um, we're also looking forward to having a newsletter shortly. So there isn't a place to sign up yet on our website, but if you would like to do that, there's a contact us um, box and you can send me an email and I'll make sure you're on the newsletter list. And that way you won't miss out on any of our future Georgia Audubon um, virtual field trips. And also these, um, the, and- If I may jump be... in for a second, Freya. So right here, I've got another accessibility challenge. There's the paved trail. There's the pavement under the picnic table, and there is absolutely nothing connecting them. And Thank the you. trees I'm underneath right now are the preferred roosting area for uh, local black crown night herons. Sometimes takes a sec to find them, but this guy is really showing off. So he's got his beak tucked into his feathers right now, but yeah, here's just one sleeping black crown night heron. Part of the reason they're called night herons is they are primarily active at night. Okay, moving over because just on another one. Here he is kind of behind the leaves. Very nice bird. Thanks, Alexander. That's that's really cool. So speaking of um, calls, there is a bit more noise over at my end right now. Uh, I'm just going to flip the camera so you can see what I'm looking at. These sandhill cranes are all out here. I'm going to be quiet for a minute so you can hear them calling, hopefully, a bit better than last time. Right, how was that? Hopefully you could, hopefully you could hear them. Um, they they make a really lovely kind of soft kind of trumpeting call. Um, sorry that they're not really being loud. <laughs> Nothing I can do about that. Um, but hopefully you heard a little bit. Um, it's a really yeah, a really lovely soft call. And and um, if if you didn't hear it then and you would like to, um, you could totally Google uh, 
Like I know the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's All About Birds website has a lot. When you look up the individual bird, they have links to the bird calls on there. So you could listen to it that way and you'll hear what I'm trying to share with you a little bit better. <laughs> Thanks so much, Freya. Alexander, I don't know if you're, oh, actually, do you mind? Yeah, go ahead, take it over, Alexander. I see you got something in the scope. All right, so right now, I just found a couple of American widgeons again. And here they are. We've got so a male on the right, female on the left, and mallard just passed in front of them. Widgeon is easily our most common duck in Los Angeles. You get them well into the hundreds every single year. They're a bit smaller than the mallard with a just a green stripe on the side of the head. And the male female has the same general shape, but it's a much less overall coloration. And I also don't know if you can hear this behind me, but I'm from the uh, flock of blackbirds that always hangs around. So I can hear uh, probably a hundred red wings calling right now. Yes. They're also mixed in with brown head cowbirds and great tailed grackles. Hey, before we um, run out of time, I know we're, we're getting close to time. Um, thanks, Alexander, for getting on so many birds for us visually. Um, Jerry, I was wondering if you could tell us just briefly a little bit about the All Persons Trail that Mass Audubon, Mass Massachusetts, Mass Audubon um, have at a few of their wildlife sanctuaries. I know you were really involved in um, helping create those trails to be as accessible as possible for everybody. And I've been to a couple, they're really awesome. Um, and so I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what makes them so special. Well, um, I've been involved in the creation of 12 accessible trails over the years with Mass Audubon. And on some of them, we have rope guided sections where a person who is blind can, once they get there, that's always the hard part, but they can navigate the trail uh, without assistance. Uh, we also have uh, made sure that they are all wheelchair accessible. We have braille signage in some places. Uh, we have uh, various things on the rope guides that tell you whether there's a bench nearby or whether there's uh, some other something that you should find across from the uh, from the rope. And we also have uh, Braille and large print um, literature related to the trails descriptions. And some of them have also a cell phone um, guide that you can call on your phone. You don't have to be there. You can call it from anywhere and listen to the descriptions of each stop on the trail and the kinds of birds that frequent the area and so on. And I had the pleasure of doing some of the audio uh, production for those and even read some of the information on a couple of the trails. So those are a few of the things we did. I don't know if you can think of anything I left out for you, but it, it was quite, a, quite an experience for me. Yeah, well, th thanks, Jerry. Yeah, it's it's really, really cool. And um, they're the best example I've seen of really, really accessible trails because of all that extra stuff like that rope and the beads on the rope that help. So um, Jerry said unassisted, unassisted, I think uh, by a sighted person acting as a sighted guide, um, he can do it by himself, which is um, really important for a lot of folks. And so um, another thing um, I know they do is they make sure their staff are trained because you've got this great visitor center and all these wonderful resources, the large print and the braille um, interpretive um, booklets. But if the, if the staff aren't trained in what these are for or how to interact with someone who's blind or has another kind of disability or accessibility challenge, that's, that's kind of a key ingredient. So um, I, know, I know Mass Audubon are kicking goals with this in a really big way. Um, they also have written up, they spent the time to write up this really fantastic booklet explaining what they did and why. And it's it's um, free to download um, from the Mass Audubon website. There is a link on our website, birdability.org under resources. Um, you, you'll find a link in there to get to to get to that to that um, guide. It's it's if you are ever involved in trails, trail design, consulting, anything like that, this is the resource that I would suggest you check out because it's it's really top notch. So 
thanks thanks for explaining about that jerry because um and hopefully in the summer we'll be able to get jerry back on one of these virtual field trips from one of those trails and he can he can really take us around i i think that would be really good. i haven't actually asked jerry if he'd be up for that but i would love it if you are jerry <laughs> <laughs> I certainly right. thank you freya and thank you jerry right now i've got some ring-billed gulls that perched here on the shore Right now, the scope is on two adult ring bills. We got the yellow beak with the black ring around the tip and yellow legs. Just to the right of them is a young California gull. It's a bit larger because it's young. It has pink legs and kind of splotchy brown on the wings. There's another young ring bill. And furthest to the right is an adult western. Western gull is our only dark-backed gull. Makes it very easy to identify. It's also our largest gull by a lot, as you can see by the ring bill next to it. It's about 10 to 15% smaller than the Western. And also perched close to me now is a snowy egret. Sorry, wind. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alexander. We're going to go ahead and start wrapping up now. But before we do, um, I wanted to um, reiterate that um, right now, you know, we're all late to the game in this, but a lot of people are thinking about, sorry, my lips are like frozen. So if I sound a little strange, that's why. <laughs> but people are thinking a lot about how to be very intentional when it comes to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it is absolutely critical that you are centering <laughs> the experiences of people who have accessibility challenges or disabilities when it comes to outdoor exploration. And so the reason why birdability is so phenomenal is because they, my mouth is really frozen. <laughs> they have incredible resources at, uh, that are at your, disposable, at, at your disposal, such as if you want to plan accessible birding trips where you are, right? There's a resource to help you do that and to think through the things you need to think about and plan for. Um, there is a map, and I want to make sure we plug this. There is a birdability map um, in which anyone, when you go outside, you go birding at a location, you go to this birdability map and you submit a site review that um, takes you through different elements of the, the trail or the location where you are um, to assess how accessible it is. It'll ask you about the slope, about the, 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 the paths, the railings, things like that, so that when someone who may experience an accessibility challenge wants to know if a certain location is accessible for them, they can look at the reviews that have been done on that place. So everyone, anyone can do that. Everyone doing their part, even for uh, an action that small, will make a really huge difference in accessibility. So please do visit <laughs> uh, birdability.org to look at all the phenomenal resources they have. Um, Freya, I'm gonna pass it to you because it is really difficult to talk right now. <laughs> My whole face is frozen. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry, Karina. <laughs> It's actually, there were flecks of snow coming at me and I'm not that many hours away from you. So yeah, I'm with you on the cold. I, c I didn't think it snowed in Alabama, but there you go. Um, yeah, I want to encourage folks, the birdability map, if you want to contribute to that so that other birders who have accessibility challenges can find out if a trail or a bird blind, for example, um, or a viewing pl platform is accessible to them, they can find that information out because a lot of websites, they'll just say it's accessible. And that's not enough. That's not enough information for most folks to know um, with some level of certainty, it's, it's something that they could, they could manage. So um, go to birdability.org and then hit the birdability map. It will take you to the National Audubon webpage where they're, um, those folks have helped us with that, which is really cool. It's a quick little checkbox survey too. It's not a thing that's going to take you half an hour. It's really quick um, and you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to have an accessibility challenge. Your best guess um, is okay for gradient. Like you're not, you're not expected to be some amazing expert in this. The idea is that the more people who contribute, the more um, help this will be for folks who, who need this information. So um, yeah, please please do check that out. And if, if you experience an accessibility challenge, hopefully this will be a helpful resource for you as well. Um, thanks, Karina, for, for that plug. And I'm, I'm really excited. This is a monthly thing. So um, the George Audubon Birdability Virtual Field Trips will be happening every month, usually the second Saturday of the month, but stay tuned to the Birdability website and George Audubon's Facebook page, and that'll keep you up to date. The next one is gonna break the rule I just said. It's gonna be on the 20th of February, Saturday the 20th of February, 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, there'll be 
there'll be four co-hosts again in all different places. So you get to go birding across the country all at once and learn a bit more about accessibility and inclusivity in birding. So please come, please come birding with us. Amazing. Thank you so much, Freya. And a big thank you to Jerry from Massachusetts and Alexander from California for showing us the incredible birds and locations uh, in the places where they go birding. So we look forward to seeing you all next month and we hope you have a fantabulous morning. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hi, thank you. It was very nice meeting you. Bye.